would like to do is sort of I'm probably going to do Q&A at the end of our session. Give you guys a chance to, to really ask some questions. Do we have a first question? My, my feet, I'm a sad Bharacharya from Songkarin Cancer Center and I have a few other ventures too. I started from the other side. I was speaking with you in the nonprofit world, socially relevant, a couple of organizations that have started 14 years ago, three years ago, but also evolving new technologies to, to serve uh, the general public. Uh, but also through that, we have come up with various ideas, applications, and various other for us, films, things like that, that we would like to launch various business uh, aspects. Now, for someone like me, how do I start up? Because I have several ideas, many things I've already started off, and now we want to secure funding through, and then go to the next stage. Through crowds yeah. crowdsourcing. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's uh, multiple elements to that question because you said you've already started it, so I'm not going to do what I typically do at startup things. Stop talking about it, just do it. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the big next step is you know really to prepare and think about like what kind of capital you need, what kind of capital is appropriate for you. You know, I even dare say sometimes that equity crowdfunding might not be for you, right? It might not be the best model forward. Um, potentially, if you have a product um, that you're trying to sell, Brookspace might be a great way to raise very early preliminary capital without giving 15% of your company away for $50,000. Um, getting it out there, you know, the proof of concept is, is a huge thing. But if you if you're more advanced in your business where you want larger chunks of capital, then you really have to start thinking about should I go the VC route. Um, should I go the angel route? Should I even go the online route, which was just never previously available? It's, it's more of an exercise in, in appropriateness for the company and the stage of life. Okay. Uh, so within fintech startups, do you guys see a lot of the, the smaller and newer companies with new product ideas having issues building consumer bases, uh, you know, especially dealing with you know the harder markets to get into, banking and so on? Are, are there issues to that end or are not so much at this point? Uh, just like I can ask, do you mean like as in consumer fintech or you're just saying like <laughs> users of like any? any users of any? Product? Yeah, so I, I would say that I think that it falls, well we look at falls into one of three categories. I would say uh, it's consumer fintech business, it, it's either it's enterprise fintech business selling to like banks for example, right. or it's a fintech business that is just the technology wrapper around um, activities that have been occurring for, for quite a while. So, and so I'll explain what each of those are. And the first one is like consumer fintech. I think they have the same problem as that like any consumer web server does, which is just user acquisition, right? Uh, and that's actually, well, there's a lot of, like we don't tend to work with them as much because there are actually a lot of benefit that a more classic like consumer web or anything PC can provide. So you guys are more B2B. Yeah, that's, that's our, our thing. Um, in the enterprise kind of institutional space, I think that's actually the most difficult because you're trying to get through things like compliance, you're trying to get like on people's radar. There's a lot of, you have to understand the dynamics of the organization. So that is a lot of like, that's actually where our, our model tries to focus, right? Where you need to kind of get the right person to understand how to talk with them. The third group is actually, I, I separate that out because one of the fascinating things to us is there's a lot of existing networks and financial services that even predate the internet, right? Like it was the original social network in, in around business. And so there's a lot of businesses where we're starting to see people just put a technology wrapper around existing kind of businesses already. And in those cases, uh, I actually think they have the easiest time because it could be a broker dealer that already has a large investor base and client base, but now they're just making a web platform, right? And they probably have the easiest time with customer acquisition because it's more of a customer transition to My question is uh, similar to the gentleman who spoke, uh, who asked the first question. Um, I, I actually had a question for all of you guys, which is um, that it's evident that you guys all have had experience uh, working with, with startups and, and developing them. So my question is, uh, what would be your advice to, let's say, 19, 20 something year olds like myself who, who have these ideas and who really want to start up, uh, but lack the credit and lack the, the real financial money to, to be able to develop outside of, let's say, our basements or outside our, our parents' homes? So. Just kind of a, a quick estimate. There's uh, there's 30 people right now that um, are bearing with us. 
through Q&A on a Monday night, and I'm guessing that uh, it's overweight entrepreneurs. So that's the first kind of thing that you could do is just stick to it. Um, and actually divide and conquer. So in college, I used to split up classes with three of my buddies so that we wouldn't all go to the same lecture and three of us could play golf and one could take notes. Um, and actually, that worked out really, really well. And it's a, it's a system that they do in med school. And uh, I think that, uh, that that's probably something that you can do is share resources. I mean, business cards can be kind of taken an OCR of and then passed around. Make sure that everybody gets to connect with those that they should be in front of and be helpful to pay it forward to your, you know, your fellow entrepreneurs that, are, that you kind of know and trust. Um, and then the other thing that I would add there is ship product with resources that you have. So most startups can be kind of MVP'd in Google Docs these days. If, um, if you can get a customer first, then you can really prove that there's an opportunity and that will let you find the resource that you need to actually scale out the product and build it. Uh, yeah, I guess my small piece of advice is just that uh, and this can be counterintuitive to what everybody else will tell you. It's just that I wouldn't be in a huge rush to be like an entrepreneur or founder, just because I think financial services in particular is very like aging, and that like it's very, there's a lot of content knowledge, there's a lot of like old networks in place, and so it, it could benefit you to actually work with another team first, right? There's nothing saying you have to be a founder like tomorrow. You could go join a product team somewhere, like really understand one segment, and once you have something that's like unique, that's yours, like you understand. I don't know what it is. Like you understand the compliance processes of broker dealers extremely well. Once you have that content knowledge, like then go out and build a business, right? I think this is a this is a sector where if you if you know what you're talking about and you're actually bringing value, that will be respected. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be running around trying to be a, a founder just because I want to be a founder. But I think it's often to work in startups. That we can make. Well, I'll keep it short. I think. Uh, if you work somewhere first, uh, the, the knowledge that you pick up is going to be invaluable, and your appreciation for startup life is going to be awesome. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the uh, the, the second thing is um, your, your job as, a, as an entrepreneur going forward is going to be finding resources. That will be your job going forward. You're not going to be doing anything else except for solving problems and finding resources. So that's the first step into it, right? You have to find the right resources in order to become an entrepreneur. Um, and if you think that you know that stops as it, as it advances, it gets worse. It gets much much worse. So you know it's something to prepare for. <laughs> so I know uh, there's a lot of like aspects of your companies that um, sort of have to do with like incubation and um, you know taking on uh, new startups and having and helping build them up. Um, what do you guys do to kind of I guess just touch upon how you sort of screen what companies you select to uh, to work with? I mean I know. Looking at like Kickstarter, anyone can kind of sign up and see how the crowd likes it. But is there, when you guys are you know, planning on offering a lot more structured service and um, you know potentially investing in these companies and connecting them, and there's a lot more that goes into it. Like, what what is what are some of the things that you're looking for? If you just tell me a little bit about like your your process in terms of that. Well, for us, we just we have a pretty. You probably have one of the more comprehensive procedures. It resembles a disclosure due diligence by a broker dealer. Um, so from the get-go, we'd rather have people prepared and not think that this is any less serious than if you raise money online. So it takes our startups a little bit longer, but they're much more prepared. Um, what we see with that is that the founders are prepared themselves. It's not that they have better legal teams. It's that they've actually thought about the problem a little bit further. They'll have the term sheet, the financial models, even if it's unpleasant for them to put together. Um, it's always better to have that from, from the beginning so that later on when you have the investment interest, they don't have to scramble to get this stuff together for the broker dealer. Uh, yeah, so kind of in, in typical fashion for our, our, our business, we're very community network focused. We actually rely a lot on the people in our, our network, to, not just to help us source those opportunities, but actually to evaluate them. So when we meet like a really interesting entrepreneur that's working on a really cool technology, uh, you know, we think that we know something about the space, but we also recognize that we there are a lot more experts in our uh, network than, than, than us. So we actually try to push it out to uh, to a number of people, and we'll look for like, kind of a minimum number of like level of interest from from like professionals in the space. Where if enough people that are potential customers think that it's an interesting idea, then we kind of delve a bit deeper into understanding it a bit more. So 
we, we try to take the approach that although we kind of know what's going on, there are, there's always some useful models in the room that's smarter than you. Great. Thank you. Well, I, th I think we'll wrap on to question. You know, how do, yeah, I don't know. You know, how do, you know, law firms are also making decisions on which clients to take, right? And when, when, you know, larger clients come to us, that's the easy choice. How do we decide which kinds of entrepreneurs to, to back because we can't, you know, we can provide legal services, we provide everyone legal services at the rates you, you, you do here, that's a tricky thing. And so I think we're looking at a lot of what he was looking at, which is really, what's, is there a prepared plan? And how is, you know, a lot of times we get people and they have no idea how they're eventually going to get to market. And how is this going to be monetized? Um, and we're not financial people, you know, some of us think we are more than others, but, um, but how, how is ultimately, you know, people have great ideas, but how is this ultimately going to be a product that someone's going to want, or are you going to be able to develop it? And and it's it, it's talking to people, and it, you know, we did a lot more in the first wave of people in New York. How, how is this ultimately going to make money and being prepared, right? And, and I think I think you only get one sort of first shot at lots of people, and the prep work, and the, whether it's lawyers, not lawyers, or other things, but the prep work of figuring out what, what the market is, who wants your product, and those kinds of things is really critical in getting the resources that you need, whether it's lawyers or people. And we see a lot of people sort of skip the step. I have a great, I, my, my 15 year old has lots of great ideas. Um, and I'm always saying, well, who would want that? Um, and then that's a different, you know, because, you know, he's, I have three kids, and he's the budding entrepreneur of the three. Um, and now, we, now when he has an idea, he'll come to me and we'll talk about it. It's part of just what we do, but it's really how are you going to develop that to the next step? And even as lawyers and as everyone else, that's what we're really looking for. In a way. You know, it doesn't matter your age or what it is, but it's how is this going to ultimately help in a, in a financial way? Um, that's how you're going to get people to provide money, unless you're doing the nonprofit way, which is a different, which is a different business. Um, but you know, when we're not trying, when we can't judge who a good who, who's ultimately going to succeed? And it's hard for your business to do that, but we can judge who has a plan to succeed. Um, we may not know who your competitors are, but we will know. Does that make sense? Does this person have a sense of what's out there? And that's the, 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 the early, not going too soon, and just having lots of friends in the business, sort of going out to the market, giving your stage at the right time. And sometimes you're too late too. So you got to figure out what's the right time. That's a, that's a critical thing in the space. So I have a question for the panel here, if I can ask everybody down the row here. Um, so we see a lot of oversaturation in certain areas of the markets that we represent. So in FinTech, there's a lot of consumer payments, right? But that probably means that you shouldn't go start a business in consumer payments right now if there's a bunch of VC money flooding in there, because it takes time to, to go in the oven. So kind of just down the row here, you know, who uh, is seeing opportunities in, in other areas, I guess Carl for FinTech saying in socially responsible businesses that aren't, you know, probably ride sharing and um, and Stuart in uh, in actually in the legal profession itself, what, what processes do you think can be kind of uh, tech enabled? Uh, sure. Actually, the one that I'm probably most excited about was the one I asked you about was um, it's like uh, online investor analytics. I think we've had a wave of kind of building online platforms to to put up investments and to put up uh, you know, companies. But what I don't see is like the glue. And that was historically the role that investment banker played, right? He understood who was the market. He understood how to sell the product. He understood who to go to. Uh, I don't see that equivalent just yet in the in the, the tech world. So I'm really interested in tools that kind of allow uh, somebody who's raising capital to more efficiently target investors in like a really smart way. Um, in addition to that, what we're really excited about is uh, the focus that the impact investing world is getting um, going forward, which basically means that the financial world does need to one day accept a metric for impact. And I think there's going to be a huge opportunity there where financial returns are intertwined with something that people understand on a more ubiquitous basis, you know, what it means to invest in a clean energy company beyond your percentage IRR, what does that really mean? Um, you know. Organizations like the GIN or you know even the UN, you know they're they're working really hard to try to come up with the right metrics 
um, which haven't been widely accepted yet, but I think as there's more attention to it, there's more attention on the investing component online, um, people are going to come up with more uh, understandable methodologies. I mean, you know, if, again, from the lawyer side, it's slightly different. I mean, we had seen at least a fair amount, and it's a different side of the fintech space, but in the in, in sort of the, the e-commerce retail space, where a lot of people were making investments in how to um, how to measure, you know, get more successful product, get more, you know, how to make people, how to find who the right buyers are, and how to get more people in, in about business. And that we haven't seen that kind of thing come in to the fintechs. We sort of had to how to measure and go find consumers that will use various financial products the same way that people are developing advertising techniques in retail stores retail and getting people online and figuring out how to do that. And that's one thing we haven't seen or I haven't seen with you know, OCLS and everyone on the fintech side. We've seen a lot of that and just in here and then talking to others on, on the e-retail side and, then, and, that's, uh, and, and that's a product to do. The other thing um, we had started to see a couple of years ago was really uh, debt type investments and really um, you know, how, to, how to, to not just have equity investments, but have to have real debt and debt trading platforms and things like that. Um, and that was a hot thing a few years ago that seems to have slowed down, but I'm not sure the particular reason why it has. But, but those are sort of two concepts that they made sense. And I think it's really, you know, I, I, I think if you're going where it's sort of as with all things, if you're going where everybody else is, that's going to be much harder than figuring out where everyone is under, under, under spending or under uh, capitalizing. Sort of geographical question. Uh, we're talking whether we're talking finance 2.0 or fintech 2.0. Uh, I think Carly mentioned uh, finance has, has all legacy structures that are easiest to replace by, by this finance and software eating, eating finance in this case, the world of finance. Do you see uh, that's happening mostly in London, finance, I mean, uh, London New York, uh, US, and San Francisco uh, to, to, to the mix, or, or do you think you see it now being uh, more dispersed? As as, uh, as it's just digital technology. Uh, so where, where where do you see it going, kind of geographically? Uh, so we've actually noticed a, a very distinct difference in companies in like the regions. Uh, in San Francisco, you tend to find more consumer-oriented businesses. I think they just generally have a lot more historical uh, experience working with the consumer web world. And so they're I, think, I don't want to say a better place, but I think that they usually have more experience and networks in place to target that space. Uh, New York, we're seeing a lot more of the institutional B2B fintech sector take off. Uh, and again, a lot of that sort of replacing old networks with kind of like you know, new online networks. It's a lot of that, how do I just take it, an old service business and make it a technology enabled service business? That's something we see a lot in New York. Uh, and then you start looking around the world, places like London, and there are niches of financial technology that are very unique. So things around like FX, you know, current crop, quarter currency payments that are, I think, actually taking off much more over there than here because it hasn't necessarily been as much of a problem in the US. So every sector has got something to add. I think they just have different priorities. A lot of them driven by, like, historical activities. Hey, guys, thank you very much. Thank you.